So I finally did it. I just built a crude but functional prototype of a switch mode power supply that converts 230 volts AC mains voltage into 5 volts DC. So let's hook it up and oh, thank god and as you can see nothing blows up and we should be getting around 5 volts on the outputs. Yes. But let me show you some interesting waveforms on the oscilloscope. Hold it! What I was about to do there is one of the biggest mistakes when working with an oscilloscope, which can lead to a lot of damage. So to make sure that you don't make such stupid mistakes, I will tell you in this video everything you need to know when using an oscilloscope. This includes all the basics, like how to choose a scope and how to do simple voltage and current measurements but also more advanced stuff like safe mains voltage measurements and FFT. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. If you ever wanted to learn how to do Arduino programming or computer programming in general, but were put off by the opaque coding language, then Brilliant is for you. By learning with the algorithm's fundamentals course, in which you shift around pseudocodes, you will grasp a good understanding on how computer algorithms work without having to dig through the weeds of coding syntax. If you want to try it out, then go to brilliant.org slash greatscots and sign up for free. And the first 200 people that sign up for an annual subscription through this link will also get a 20% discount. First off, let me tell you in one sentence why you would even need an oscilloscope. It visualizes a voltage and or current value over time. And since not only power electronics nowadays get switched on and off repeatedly, but also data communication protocols with their ones and zeros, it is pretty essential to see those waveforms when building or repairing electronics. And with that being said, let's get rid of my overkill oscilloscope, that due to its price pretty much none of my viewers own. And instead, let's focus on this more budget-friendly option, which still costs quite a bit of money. Of course, you can go even cheaper when buying an oscilloscope, but you should always consider the amount of channels, the available bandwidth and the sampling rate when choosing one. The amount of channels is pretty straightforward and determines how many voltage and or current signals you can have a look at simultaneously. I would always prefer a 4 channel scope, because there are plenty of situations in which you want to have a look at more than two signals at the same time. Next, the bandwidth describes the frequency at which the input signal gets damped by minus 3 decibel, meaning its amplitude value goes down to 70.7% of its original value. As an example, my function generator here produces a sine wave with a variable frequency. And as you can see on the oscilloscope, at the higher frequencies of 80 MHz, the amplitude gets a bit lowered. The reason is that the oscilloscope acts kind of like a low pass filter, which not only damps the amplitude, but also distorts for example the rise time, which we want to avoid. So a rule of thumb is that my 200 MHz scope can handle one fifth of its bandwidth with ease so a signal with a frequency of 40 MHz, which is plenty for lots of applications. And while the bandwidth is more like an analog value, the sampling rate is a purely digital one. It describes how many measurements the scope can take in a second. And let me tell you that 2 giga samples per second is plenty. I also worked with lower sampling rate models and never got any problems even when we consider that by using more channels, the sampling rate splits up. And with this knowledge so far, you were able to choose an oscilloscope that suits your project needs. And you just unpacked it and discovered four of those probes. Those are passive probes and they are super easy to work with. But let's not talk about why I only got three of them along with the wrong probe heads. 
To use them, simply hook up the BNC connector, select a scaling factor which is either X1 or X10, attach your alligator clip to ground and use the tip of the probe to touch the point of your circuit you're interested in. And just like that, you see something on the screen, which we will trigger correctly in a minute. But before that, let me tell you that the scaling factor either decreases the voltage signal by a factor of 10, or does not change it at all with X1. But that means it comes with a lower resistance and higher capacitance, so the bandwidth we talked about earlier is lower. That is why I always use X10, which guarantees the highest bandwidth. Of course, we could talk hours about the impedance input of the scope and probes here. But to keep it simple, let's skip that part and instead let's focus on our scope display. This is a classic example of wrong triggering. The trigger is used in order to create a stationary image of our periodic signal, by capturing the waveform at always the same point, which can be for example a rising or falling edge. But by pressing the trigger button on the scope and selecting trigger type, we can see that it can also be a certain pulse width, a pattern or specific rise or fall time. But most of the time the edge option works just fine. And by lowering the trigger threshold value into the voltage region of our signal, we can see that we got a beautiful PWM signal, whose voltage amplitude is way too low. As you can see, my vertical voltage division is 200 mV per division which you can by the way change by using the vertical knob. But anyway, my project works with a logic voltage of 5V, so why am I seeing around 500mV? This is also a beginner's mistake and can be solved by simply choosing the correct scaling factor. And since we talked about the vertical voltage division, we might as well talk about the horizontal time division which is right now 10 microseconds per division. But we can change it down and up as well in order to present our waveform in the best way. With the known time division we can also calculate the frequency of our signal, which should be around 33 kHz. But to be honest, no one does this anymore with digital scopes since they come with tons of measuring features, which of course includes measuring the frequency. And if you want to for example measure the rise time of a MOSFET gate, which describes how long it takes the voltage to go from 10% to 90% of its intended value, then simply hit the stop button, zoom in and activate the cursor function. With it you can select track waveform and you get two cursors which you can now move to the desired voltage value positions in order to determine the time difference between them and thus get the rise time. Ok, moving on to a different example, in which I now want to see how much voltage ripple this small boost converter comes with on its outputs while powering a load. Of course, we could adjust the offset of the signal and then zoom in but that can be a hassle. Instead, we can change the input coupling to AC, which, simplified speaking, adds a small capacitor in series to the input of the scope that only lets AC pass. This way, we remove the offset voltage and all we have to do is zoom in and use a measure function in order to find out that the boost converter comes with a ripple of 4.2 volts peak to peak which means the boost converter is definitely not suitable for this job. Now for my last voltage measuring example, I want to see how this capacitor charges up. But as you can see with the current settings, we cannot really capture that charging curve. Thankfully, all we have to do is to select single mode capturing. Now the scope will trigger as soon as the capacitor reaches the trigger threshold voltage. And just like that, we got a lovely waveform which we can now analyze. At this point, you probably already noticed that a scope can only directly measure a voltage signal. So in order to measure a current, we would either need a current shunt or a current clamp. I actually talked about both of these methods in my recent video about creating a DIY current clamp. So definitely check that out if you're interested. 
But in a nutshell, I would always recommend such a current clamp, since it is super simple to set up and easy to use. And with that being said, you should now be familiar with all the basics when it comes to using an oscilloscope. So let's move on to the advanced section with a mains voltage example. And like always, I have to warn you that mains voltage can lead to major injuries if not handled correctly. But anyway, the RMS voltage value of our mains voltage is around 230 volts, which according to the datasheet of the oscilloscope, is above the maximum rated input voltage. But since we're using a scaling factor of 10 to 1, which decreases the voltage to 23 volts, and because the probe can handle 300 volts RMS, we should be just fine. And as you can see, by touching a mains voltage point with the probe, nothing explodes. And all that is left to do is to hook up the alligator ground reference to the reference point. Which is the mistake you should definitely not do. You see, this alligator clip is connected directly to the PE wire of our electrical system through the BNC connectors. And by connecting the PE wire directly or partly to the L or N phase of our electrical system, we either trip the RCD in the best case or trip our circuit breaker in the worst case, which could potentially destroy something in our scope due to a high current flow. To solve this problem, we can use such differential probes, whose input and output is isolated from one another. This way, we can hook up mains voltage without having to worry about that something will get destroyed. Now of course, when it comes to power electronics, which is my specialty, then the math function along with the FFT function is also pretty important. But to learn more about that, I would recommend you to watch my video about all the different kinds of power forms that exist. With that being said, you should now be ready to play around with your first oscilloscope and discover all of its benefits without blowing anything up. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then consider supporting me through Patreon. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Stay creative and I will see you next time!